Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for being here with us today as we continue with the CalOR training series. This is the fourth in our CalOR webinar series, the CalOR Performance Measures Existing Reporting. During today's training, please type any questions into the chat box and we'll address questions at the end of the training as time allows. I'm Juliana Vinilas, and I'm the CalOR Specialist here at CDSS. And joining me today is Michael Billingsley, and he's a CalWorks Research Data Analyst. Uh, so now we'll take a quick look at uh, today's training agenda. With today's training, we'll dive into the CalOR existing reporting measures. By the end of the presentation, our goal is that you'll be able to explain what each existing reporting measure represents and who is included in them. We'll accomplish this by providing an overview of each existing reporting performance measure and then looking at a visual depiction of the measure. In July, CDSS sent counties the first round of calculated CalOR performance measures. You may notice that the visuals we'll be looking at today look like what was sent out in the transmittal. We're hoping that this presentation will also serve to cement understanding of the measure files sent out. You've heard us say this before, but as we continue with our performance measure focused trainings, we want to pause and remind everyone that the performance measures are only one piece of CalOR. CalOR is a continuous quality improvement process, and the measures alone are not CalOR. They will help guide and inform analysis in the county self-assessment and assist in identifying areas for improvement and innovation in the system improvement plan. With that said, while the measures themselves are not CalOR, they will provide new and important information about our CalWorks program. Just as a quick reminder, each webinar recording and associated materials will be posted on the CalOR website within about three weeks of the conclusion of the webinar. However, the PowerPoints associated with today's training are already posted online. So if you prefer to print them out and follow them, follow them along that way, you are welcome to do so. Today's training is the next step in a series of trainings to help prepare and support you all to effectively engage in and reap the benefits of CalOR. We started with the CalOR 101 and the CalOR data overview sessions, where we provided conceptual overviews designed to help establish a shared knowledge and awareness of CalOR, and to lay the groundwork for today's and for future training. We split the performance measure trainings into four parts. The first two trainings covered the phase one measures and the demographic data elements utilized throughout the measures. Today's training will look at the existing reporting measures. Finally, the phase two measure training will be scheduled for spring of 2020. On August 16th and 21st, we'll begin delivering a training with our uh, HVP partners that will cover the new case flag special indicators and SAWS for the home visiting program tracking and how those indicators will be used for HVP and for CalOR. Invitations have already gone out. We'll round out the data training with a QA, QC session and a data dashboard demo. As a reminder, during the first CalOR cycle, the performance measures will be calculated and reported in a staggered manner, with the measures organized into three groups, existing reporting, phase one, and phase two measures. Only the existing reporting and phase one measures are included in the first county self-assessment. So as I said, today's training will focus on the existing reporting measures group. These are the measures that utilize EDD and MEDS data. This includes the employment rate of current CalWORKs individuals, wage progression, post CalWORKs employment rate, rate of exits with earnings, rate of program reentries, rate of program reentries after exit with earnings, and intergenerational CalWORKs enrollment rate. Before we dive in, there are several important notes about these measures. These are all outcome measures meaning that the information gleaned from these measures will help the state to define and measure program success at a high level across counties and help answer questions like, is our funding and program design producing the intended outcomes across all counties? 
All of these measures utilize EDD and or MES as the primary data source for the calculation. However, once SAWS begins sending the CalOR data files for the Phase 1 measures to CDFS, we will be utilizing demographic data reported in those files to supplement the demographic breakouts for these measures. There are several terms used throughout this presentation that we want to define right off the bat just to make sure that everyone understands. First is program exit. For the purposes of CalOR, program exit is defined as no member of the assistant unit receiving a CalWorks cash grant for 90 days. The date of exit is the first day that no member of the AU received a CalWORKS cash grant. Next is welfare-to-work individual. For the purposes of CalOR and the measures that we're looking at today, welfare-to-work individuals are determined by aid code. Adults in an AU with a single parent, two-parent, non-MOE funded, or TANF timed out aid code are included as a welfare-to-work individual. If the individual has exited CalWORKS, the status is based on their most recent month on CalWORKS aid. The idea here is to capture anyone that is supposed to be, um, is supposed to be participating in welfare to work or was ever supposed to be participating in welfare to work or ever benefited from the welfare to work program in some way. The initial set of measure calculations that were sent to counties in July utilized the most recent data available for each specific measure at the time that we calculated the measures. Here you can see the measurement time period for each calculation, indicated by the blue shading. We'll look closer at the time frames when discussing each individual measure. The next transmission will move forward one time period. For today's presentation, we'll follow the same structure for each measure. We'll begin by looking at some basic information about the measure, the numerator, the denominator, the data source, and frequency of calculation. Then we'll look at an example measure visualization, similar to what counties saw in the first CalOR measure transmittal in July. We walked through an example of a measure calculation in the recent phase one measure training, and we'll quickly revisit that same example to ensure that we're all working with the same understanding. The denominator is the total population that we're looking at, and the numerator are people in the denominator that satisfy a certain condition. So for someone to be included in the numerator, they must first be in the denominator. The way that the calculation works is from top to bottom. The numerator divided by the denominator gives you the measure calculation. So for example, if we want to know what percentage of people in the group smoke, and there are 100 people in the group, and 10 people smoke, mm -hmm. our numerator is 10, our denominator is 100, so our calculation is 10 divided by 100, or 10%. Now I'm going to hand it over to Michael, and he's going to walk you through the first three measures. Well, thank you, Juliana, and good morning, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us again today. And let's start a review of the existing measures in CalOR with the employment rate of CalWORKs individuals. So this is a pretty straightforward measure and calculation. It's simply the ratio of, of all current welfare to work individuals as a denominator, how many of them have a wage record in the EDD base wage file in the measurement period for the numerator. Again, counties will not calculate this measure or submit any specific data for this measure other than the demographic information. And this calculation utilizes data from the meds to determine from the meds file to determine the denominator or those current welfare to work individuals. And then this is matched with the EDD base wage file data to find which of those current welfare to work individuals have a wage record in the report quarter. And this measure will be calculated quarterly to align with the timing of the EDD base wage file. So here's what the presentation of the employment rate of current welfare to work individuals will look like graphically. Where on the left, you see the county rate in blue, which is 35.6%, which means that 35.6% of all current welfare to work individuals in County A have a record of EDD wages in the measurement quarter. And to the right, you see the state rate which is 38%, which means that 38% of all current welfare to work individuals in the state 
have an EDD wage record for the identical report quarter. And just to clarify, we got a couple of questions about this. The state rate is for all 58 counties. So it would also include the county in question. So for example, County A is also included in the state rate. Next, let's look, at, let's look at the next measure, which is wage progression. It's a little more involved than the previous measure. The wage progression attempts to quantify the change in median income for cohorts based on the quarter of exit from CalWORKs. So the measure will re be reported using the cohort median wage for three periods for cohort one and two periods for cohort two. Both cohort one and cohort two will have median wages reported for their entry quarter and cohort one and cohort two will have median wages reported six months after exit but cohort one will also have one year after exit and this measure will again utilize a match of data from meds and edd and will be calculated quarterly to align with reporting in the edd base wage file so again, for this measure, we have two cohorts and slightly different measurement periods for each cohort. So let's see how that works with the help of this handy dandy calendar. First, let's recall that this measure uses median earnings, which are different than average earnings. Median, median is a measure of dispersal, where the median is the data point directly in the middle, which means that median earning, earnings provide the amount of earnings that half the individuals have more than and half have less than. Wages and earnings are most often measured using median and not average because incomes at either end can significantly skew an average but do not overly affect the median. So we know that for this measure, cohorts are defined by the quarter of exit. So here, cohort one is all individuals who left CalWORKs in the fourth quarter of 2017. So we have our cohort one. Now let's find their median earnings. For each cohort in each period, all ED reported earnings will be compiled and then a median amount will be identified as the data point for that specific cohort and time period. Using the data that identifies the individual members of cohort one, we look back and find each individual's entry quarter. Of course, there'll be a lot of variance in this because people who exit in a specific quarter can come on aid at many different periods. But we will look back, find the entry quarter for each individual in the cohort, and if they have EDD reported wages in their entry quarter, they will be included in the calculation for that entry period. Then we will derive a median income for that cohort's entry quarter. Then we follow that same cohort that exited in quarter four of 2017 and determine the EDD reported wages for that group for the second quarter after exit and determine the median income for that period. Then the same process is followed to derive the median wage for that quarter four 2017 exit cohort in the fourth quarter after exit. And that way we'll have median wages derived for that cohort at the three separate time periods at entry, two quarters after exit, and four quarters after exit. Now for cohort two, you see in the example that they are defined as all those having exited CalWORKs in the second quarter of 2018. And so for this cohort, we again look back to the entry quarter for each individual who exited in quarter two of 2018, and we derive the median wage for that exit cohort. Then we look to the second quarter after exit, and in this case, that's quarter four of 2018, where we find the EDD reported wages for the group that exited in quarter two of 2018 and derive the median wage for that period. Ultimately, this is done to determine the change in wages for the cohorts and so we can help better understand the wage trajectory of CalWORKs clients at entry and in the directly post-aid period. So here's what the calculated wage progression measure will look like in the data file counties receive. First, we want to remind everyone that these values are totals for a quarter. They are not each month in the quarter. They are the quarter total and having EDD reported wages in the quarter includes someone in the measure. So it's not inconceivable that someone could have wages only in one month or two months or every month in the quarter. EDD reminds us that it's not accurate to divide these totals by three to come up with a monthly amount. That's not what this shows. Also acknowledge all the other attendant difficulties in using EDD based wage data. Some jobs don't report to EDD. Total wages have to be above a certain amount. Wages 
earned outside of California are not included. However, we still think this measure shows us something important about the outcomes for some people that experience the CalWORKs program. Okay, Whew. let's go through this graphic. So at the top, you see cohort one. As you recall, our friends who exited in quarter four of 2017 as the blue shaded bars next to the median wages for the same exit cohort but for the state as a whole, those are represented in the brown and orange bars. And this is important that the state look is the exact same measurement period as the county look. Here, it's all of those who ended and exited in the fourth quarter of 2017. And the county A values are included in the state totals. So here we can see that county A cohort one has slightly higher median wages than the state in the entry quarter, 1761 to 1717. But entry quarter values will likely be very similar due to the income eligibility requirements for CalWORKs. Regardless, the next columns show the median wages for cohort one county A and the state overall two quarters after exit. And we see there that cohort one from county A has higher median wages than the state overall two quarters after exit at 5,423 compared to 5,256. Then the last bars are cohort one four quarters after exit and the state rate for the same period. And we see here that county A median wages for cohort one are now less than the state median wage for the same group, 4,828 to 5792. So this might be an interesting data point to examine, follow over time and see if this is a trend that developed and remains consistent over time. The bottom box shows the wage progression for cohort two, our friends that exited CalWORKs in the second quarter of 2018. Again, the blue bars represent County A and the brown and orange bars the state for the same exit period cohort. We see that County A again has a median wage in the entry quarter higher than the state at 1786 and 1701 respectively. And again, higher wages in the second quarter after exit at 5865 compared to 5490. Also, both of cohort two wages are higher than cohort one in County A. So we'll have to wait and see if cohort two from County A has lower wages four quarters after the exit, similar to cohort one. And while we acknowledge this measure has a few moving parts, we hope and we think it can be very informative and after a few cycles, uh, build a more definitive wage trend line to develop. Okay, the next measure we examine is the post CalWORKs employment rate. This is simply a measure of how many people who exited CalWORKs in a specific quarter had EDD reported wages two and four quarters after exit. So it's very similar to the last measure but instead of asking how much people made, it just asks how many people have wages six months and a year after leaving the program. So the denominator of this measure is the same as the last measure. Cohorts are defined as welfare to work individuals who exited the program in a specific quarter. And the numerator is of those individuals who exited the program in that specific quarter, how many have reported EDD wages in the measurement quarter here two and four quarters after exit. And again, this measure utilizes a data match between meds and EDD. And like all measures using EDD, this one will be calculated on a quarterly schedule and no specific county data will be utilized except for the demographic breakouts. Let's unpack this measure a little more with the help of our handy calendar. So for cohort one, our friends who exited CalWORKs in the fourth quarter of 2017, we simply follow them forward two quarters after exit to quarter two of 2018, highlighted in the blue box, and see how many of them have EDD reported wages in that measurement period. Then we do the same calculation for the same quarter four 2017 exit cohort, but now we look four quarters after exit, in this case, quarter four of 2018. Again, highlighted by the blue box. We do a little simple division and voila, we have our post CalWORKs employment rate for cohort one in the two periods. Then for cohort two, again, our friends that exited CalWORKs in the second quarter of 2018, we look forward two quarters to quarter four of 2018, perform the same calculation and derive the post CalWORKs employment rate for our cohort two, easy peasy. Okay, let's take a look at the graphic depiction of this measure 
and this will be what counties will receive in their data transmission. At the top, we have cohort one, county A in the blue, and the corresponding state rates in brown and orange to the right. Here we see that 53.9 of county A cohort one had reported wages two quarters after exit, and 54.2 had reported wages four quarters after exit. This contrasts with the state rates of 53.3 in the second quarter and 53.4 in the fourth quarter after exit for all people who exited CalWORKs in the exit cohort in the state. At the bottom, we see the values for cohort two in blue, and again, the state rate in orange. And we see that County A cohort two had a post CalWORKs employment rate of 53% in the second quarter after exit compared to the state rate, which was 53.3% for that same period. Okay, thanks for staying with us through that. We hope these measures will be informative. We think they will be and enable the development of a trend line for understanding better employment outcomes for CalWORKs exiters. Now I'm gonna send this back to our good friend, Juliana, who will describe the next three measures. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. That was a lot. Um, so the next three measures are a little bit simpler than the ones Michael just described. But before we move on to talk about those measures, I'm gonna pause for a moment and just address some questions that we've gotten in while Michael was presenting. The first question was a request to repeat the definition of welfare to work individual. So I will go ahead and do that, but also just note that all of the questions and answers from this training and from the training that we did on Tuesday will be posted online. And so the welfare to work individual um, definition will be part of that Q&A, so you'll have it in writing there. Um, but for the purposes of CalOR and the measures that we're looking at today, welfare to work individuals are determined by age code. Um, so adults in an AU with a single parent, two parent, non-MOE funded or TANF timed out aid code are included as a welfare to work individual. If the individual has exited CalWORKs, the status is based on the most recent month on CalWORKs aid. Okay, and then we have um, one other question. Um, question on chart one, so this has to do with wage progression. The entry quarter is defined as the quarter the individual entered the program. Cohort one in this chart exited CalWORKs in the fourth quarter of 2017. My question is, if all the participants in cohort one entered the program at the same time, uh, it seems it could be months or years prior to exiting CalWORKs. If individuals came into CalWORKs, at different quarters is the average income of those quarters $1,700 statewide. So, first of all, your first, your first question is true, that, we, that cohorts are defined by the quarter of exit. So if through some miraculously statistical anomaly, everyone who exited in quarter four of 2017 all came on the program at, some, some, at the same identical quarter, those people that that quarter and their wages would be the wages that would be included. And also, this is not an average, this is a median. So there's no average calculation here, right? The, I think the question was, if something happened, what would be the average? This is a median. So it doesn't add everything together and then divide by the number. It just kind of lays out all the numbers and the median is the number in the middle of the dispersal. And also just to just to clarify too that the number the the wage is a total for the quarter, right? So it's not an average by month or anything like that. It's like in this case, if someone made, let's say, make it easy for me, if, if their quarterly wage was $1,200, that's what they made across all three months added together. It's not, like I said, it's not accurate, or EDD says it's not proper to divide those by three to get a monthly total, because we don't know when in the quarter those wages were earned, just across the three months that encompass the quarter, 
added together as a total, that's the number. And then we take that for each person, lay it out in a line, and the middle number is the median number that we use. I hope that answered the question. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. Okay. So now we'll go ahead and we'll move on to three measures that look at some aspect of CalWORKs exits and reentries. Um, and we'll, we're going to go ahead and start with the rate of exits with earnings. In this measure, we're trying to assess what portion of CalWORKs exiters have earnings at their time of exit. We'll be using EDD and MEDS data to calculate this on a quarterly basis. We'll start by looking at all welfare to work individuals that exit CalWORKs in the given quarter using MEDS data. And then we'll look at of those individuals who had EDD reported earnings during that same time period. At the bottom of the slide, you'll see a timetable displaying the measurement period of the first set of measure calculations. For this calculation, data from October through December 2018 was utilized which is indicated by the blue shading. So this measure is simpler than the previous ones in that we're using a snapshot of quarterly data as opposed to cohorts or time periods that we're crossing. Here you see an example of what the calculated rate looks like for County A and the statewide calculation. From October through December 2018, 53.3% of welfare-to-work individuals that exited CalWORKs had EDD reported earnings in their quarter of exit. And this is slightly below the statewide average of 55%. Now we'll take a look at the rate of program reentries. In this measure, we want to find out who returns to CalWORKs within 12 months after exiting. For this measure, we'll be using MEDS data to calculate this on a monthly basis. Our denominator is very similar to our previous denominator. We start by looking at all welfare-to-work individuals that exit CalWORKs in a given month, and that's our denominator. We get our numerator by seeing of those individuals who re-enters CalWORKs in the 12-month period following the month of exit. Again, the timetable displaying the measurement period for the first set of measure calculations is located at the bottom of the slide. For this calculation, we looked at those that exited CalWORKs in October, November, and December 2017. And then we followed them for a year after exit to see if they returned to aid. The 12-month period during which we followed those individuals is indicated by the blue shading. Here you see an example of what the calculated rates look like for County A and the statewide calculation. This looks slightly different from the previous calculation because this is a monthly measure. So we're actually looking at three different calculations here. On the left-hand side, you can see County A's calculations. Of the welfare-to-work individuals that exited CalWORKs in October 2017, 14.6% returned to CalWORKs within 12 months of their exit. Then, of the welfare-to-work individuals that exited CalWORKs in November 2017, 13.3% returned to CalWORKs within 12 months of their exit. And finally, 14.3% of welfare-to-work individuals that exited CalWORKs in December 2017 returned to CalWORKs within 12 months of their exit. County A's rate of program reentries is slightly less than the statewide averages, which you see on the right-hand side of the graph, represented by the orange-colored bars. This means that County A has fewer clients to return to aid than the statewide average. And finally, the last in our package of exit and reentry measures, the rate of program reentries after exit with earnings. This measure is a more nuanced look at the program reentries measure that we just discussed and looks specifically at welfare to work individuals. Here, we're looking at the reentry rate of those with earnings. We go back to calculating this quarterly using both EDD and MEDS data. Our denominator is very similar to our previous denominator. We start by looking at all welfare to work individuals that exited CalWORKs in the given quarter 
but this time we add the additional layer that those individuals have earnings during their quarter of exit. We get our numerator by seeing of those individuals who re-enters CalWORKs in the 12 month period following the month of exit. Again, the timetable displaying the measurement period of the first set of measure calculations is located at the bottom of the slide. For this calculation, we looked at those that exited CalWORKs and had earnings between October and December 2017. Then, we followed them for a year after exit to see if they returned to aid. That 12-month period is identified by the blue shading. All right, so here you see an example of what the calculated rate looks like for County A and the statewide calculation. The blue bar on the left shows that for County A, 13.5% of welfare-to-work individuals that exited CalWORKs and had earnings between October and December 2017 later returned to CalWORKs within 12 months. This is less than the statewide rate of 15.4%. All right, and now I'm going to hand it back to Michael to take us through the rest of the presentation. Okay, thanks, Juliana, and thanks everybody else for staying with Okay, so we're gonna actually just pause and we're gonna answer the questions that have come in and then we'll go through our last measure just so that the questions are fresh um, with the measures that we're talking about. So the first question for earnings, is this defined as earned income or does unearned income also count? EDD considers only earned income. So like in, there's a lot of uh, caveats and a lot of carve outs. So yeah, it's just wage income or income that's earned and reported as earned. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so the next question, are you using MEDS to determine the CalWORKs discontinuance date for welfare to work individuals? So that's right, we're using MEDS to determine when the individual left assistance. Is the date of reentry based on a client's actual date of approval of CalWORKs? The date of reentry is also based on MEDS data. So it's when the individual shows up in MEDS as receiving CalWORKs. All right, and then the final question that we've received so far, um, the question is on exits with earnings. The earnings must be after the exit date, correct? So actually, no. Unfortunately, um, the, just due to data restrictions, the way it works is that the earnings could have been before the date of exit or after the date of exit or both or some combination of that because we're looking at a snapshot of the quarter of exit and the way that wages are reported to EDD is quarterly. So all we know is that they had some EDD reported earnings during that time period, not when they occurred. So you could imagine someone could leave aid on the first day of the quarter and have wages later. And in that case, yeah, the wages would come after, but they could also have wages in, they could have wages in the first day of the quarter and not leave till later in the quarter, and it's all it's all just a quarterly look. So that's because of limitations of EDD. That's the way it's calculated. Excellent, and that's all the questions we've gotten so far. So we'll go ahead and let Michael take us through the finish line, and then you'll have an additional opportunity to pose any other questions. All right, thanks, Juliana, and thanks everybody for staying with us this morning. Um, the next measure we're going to look at is the intergenerational CalWORKs enrollment rate. And this is a very interesting measure because we know that there is great interest in multi-generational receipt of CalWORKs. And this measure attempts to quantify the magnitude of that intergenerational CalWORKs receipt. So basically, we are asking the question, of all current CalWORKs individuals, how many received at least one month of CalWORKs as children, which we define as children as anyone under the age of 18. So it's important to note that this measure will only be calculated at the state level. No county specific measurement of this will be created. Also, the measure will be calculated semi-annually. So twice a year, we will look at and measure, again, of all current CalWORKs individuals as the denominator of the measure, how many were found 
in the records to have received CalWORKs while under 18. So we acknowledge a couple limitations here, that we can only count those who receive CalWORKs, not aid from another state, and also because the comprehensive data required for this measure only begins in 1987, we eliminated the calculation, from the calculation, any person that was 18 or over on CalWORKs in 1987. So we realized that could leave out some people of the measure. So let's look at what this calculation graphic will look like. And it's simply one bar representing the state for the measurement period. And we can see from this example that in this case, the intergenerational CalWORKs enrollment rate is 11.7%, which means that 11.7% of current adults on CalWORKs were found to have been recipients of CalWORKs while they were under 18 years of age. Okay? Wow. That's a lot. And that's all for today's existing measures review. Thank you so much for your attention and staying with us. Of course, we'll continue to answer questions. As time allows, please input your questions into the chat box and we'll do our best to answer them. Some of the, we know some of these measures are a little complicated, but we believe the information gained will be useful in the CalOR continuous quality improvement effort. And one more brief caveat about the hopes for the CalOR process is that we'll be undergoing a robust upfront data validation process to build shared confidence in the CalOR data and the resulting measure calculation. And the intent of this robust validation process is to build confidence in the data, thereby relieving counties from the burdens of independently verifying each and every data point in the measure calculation. Again, we know this is up to each county to complete the validation of their data to the extent that they feel is necessary and sufficient, but we hope as time passes and people begin to feel confident in the CalOR data and the measure calculation that they could just look at the data and maybe perform a random number of spot checks and dig in more to any measure that they see as unusual or un unexpected. But CDSS is calculating these measures to help relieve the burden of counties having to do them, and it kind of defeats that purpose if counties completely duplicate the effort. Again, we know we aren't there yet, and this is a county decision, but that is our hope for the CalOR process, and we all know hope is a good thing. Okay, so let's take a quick look at the content that will be covered in each of the upcoming performance measure trainings. So the phase two measures will be the final training in our performance measure series, but this training will not occur until 2020, and as a reminder, counties are not required to include these measures in the first county self-assessment. Let's run through them briefly. Phase two CalOR performance measures, OCAT appraisal to next activity timeliness rate, education and skills development access rate, education and skills development utilization rate, child care access rate, homeless assistance and housing support program access rate, ancillary services access rate, transportation provision timeliness rate, subsidized to unsubsidized employment rate, educational completion rate, home visiting transitions to welfare to work engagement rate, and finally, family stabilization transition to welfare to work engagement rate. So for additional information, please access the resources you see listed on your screen here. I would suggest that you go early and often to the CalOR website for everything CalOR related. Any questions, you can also feel free to email the CalOR inbox. And for data file questions, you please send those questions to the data file inbox as well. Remember that the CalOR forums are held every second and fourth Wednesday from 11 o'clock to noon and they've been very instructive and very robust, and we encourage your participation in those. Yeah, the next forum that's coming up is next week on the 14th. Can't wait. And so if there's anything from today's presentation that sparks a question or a line of thought that you want to discuss, if you, you can bring that with you to the forum next week, and we can talk about the existing measures, um, the transmittal that went out, or anything else 
Cal or related. And yeah, thanks, Julia. And the, the idea of the forums is just ongoing. We're going to keep the communication open because we know that we've gone through the measures and we realize we're, we're getting questions about things that we talked about earlier. And that's totally appropriate because as you start to engage with this data and these measures, as questions come up, please feel free to bring them to the CALOR forum or send them to the CALOR inbox. And like right now is not the only time you can ask questions about these measures that we're talking about or any measures. We're going to keep the communication going throughout the whole process because as we keep saying, CALOR is going to be a learning experience for everybody. Okay, so some time for questions. We've gotten a couple additional questions come in. Um, so the first one, Michael, can you please restate what you said regarding upfront data validation? I don't know if I can or not, but let's see. So upfront data validation is we will be undergoing a robust upfront data validation process. So we're going to work with the counties and the consortia to make sure that the measure calculations and the data that we use for the measure is agreed to by the county, that they understand where the data is coming from, how the data is being calculated, and we're going to really put a lot of effort into that upfront validation. We're going to come out to counties. We're going to be feel free to talk about it in the CalOR forums. It's a big part of CalOR. We really want to build confidence in the data and the measure calculation because as we said there's a lot here and we understand that especially for the first round or so counties are going to go back and reverse engineer and validate every data point but we hope as time moves forward counties could just get a process where they do like a random qc spot check of certain variables and not have to do the whole work of validating every every single measure and every single calculation every time. But we realize we can't expect counties to do that until we all are very confident in what's being presented, and that's what the data validation is going to endeavor to do. And I'll just add a couple of little notes to that. Um, first is that it's not going to be something we're doing with all counties. We're going um, to work with a sampling of counties, um, so there's been counties selected from each consortia to participate. Um, and then also that it will be on the phase one and phase two measures. So specifically on the data that um, is coming from SAWS and used in the measure calculation. Uh, the first kind of round of data validation, the, the effort between CDFS, those select counties and SAWS will occur later this year looking like probably November, um, and then there will be another round of data validation that occurs next year. So we're splitting it out to be consistent with the phasing of the measures. So this year we'll be doing the data validation process on the data for those phase one measures. And then next year we'll be doing a similar process for the data um, that's going to be used in the phase two measures. Okay, so the next question, please give examples which subjects should be sent to the CalOR inbox and which ones should be sent to the CalOR data file inbox. Um, so the CalOR inbox is intended to um, kind of serve as a, um, a Catch -all. inbox for anything kind of CalOR related. Can you put this aside? So we'll go back to that slide real quick. Um, and the, the second inbox that you see on your screen, the CalOR data file inbox, is really for questions specific to the Cal or data file series. So there's the Cal or data file 19, 19A, 19B, et cetera. Um, and so if you have technical questions about those data files, you would want to send that to this second inbox that you see on your screen. However, it's all coming to CDFS. Yeah. So if you happen to send it to the wrong inbox, it's not an issue. We'll make sure that it gets directed to the right person. And if ever in doubt, just default to that general CalOR inbox, the CalOR um, with a hyphen at dss.ca.gov. Um, okay, so the next question. There was an Outlook meeting cancellation sent out recently for the second Wednesday CalOR forum call. 
The previous meeting was showing the meeting as every two weeks, not the second Wednesday of the month, and had the incorrect date starting in November. Duplicate that got sent out. So it sounds like a duplicate accidentally got sent out, and so we went ahead and canceled that. But the forums are still scheduled for the second and fourth Wednesday, 11 a.m. to noon. The plan has not changed there. Sorry for any uh, confusion that that may have caused. Um, the information is uh, for the forums is on the CalOR website. So if you go to the CalOR website, you'll be able to get um, the link for the GoToWebinar to register for the forums um, and all kind of information around that. Um, but yes, still scheduled second and fourth Wednesdays. Okay. The next question, will you be sharing the names of the counties you are working with on the data validation? Yeah, we will be. Once everything is finalized, um, we will be sharing the names and um, we'll do some sort of, um, we'll have some sort of conversation with counties or presentation that kind of goes over the process that was used and the results and hoping that those counties that participated in the validation process are able to kind of participate in those uh, conversation so that that will be shared um, when we're a little bit further along in the process okay so we'll pause for just a moment allow folks to um, type in any other burning questions on their mind um, so we're going to go mute for one minute and then um, we'll come back and answer any remaining questions and then close out today's presentation Okay, so we've got one more question. We'll go ahead and address that, and then we will close out today's call. Are the aid codes that will be pulled from MEDS identified in a current document for counties to review? So no, the aid codes specifically are not laid out in any document. ACL 1940 lays out the case types that are used in each measure in attachment one. And the aid codes that are related to those measures are the ones that we are pulling. If this is something that counties are interested in seeing, then it's certainly something that we can make available. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks to Iana. So before logging off, we ask that you click on one final link in your chat window that will take you to a training evaluation. It has seven brief questions and should only take a couple minutes to fill out. And again, thanks for coming and hanging out with us this morning as going over the Cal or performance measures. And thanks for working with us in this exciting Cal or process. And we look forward to your participation in the Cal or forums and all other Cal or related shenanigans. Thank you so much. <laughs>